Chapter 9 Deflecting the Executive Explosion Recognize the Upside and Downside of Corporate Executives Joining MLM While conducting a recent MLM college class in South Korea, we were asked a loaded question. In a most sincere manner, a gentleman inquired, What have all those corporate managers in America who are being laid off by the thousands been doing for all those years when they were on the job? If the American corporate strategy for increasing profits is to simply get rid of executives and managers, how could those people have been productive in the first place? Before either of us could give an answer, another South Korean gentleman offered this explanation. American corporations, he said, are just like a handful of our Asian businesses. Executives go to meetings all day to plan future meetings and write memos promising to send another one soon. Of course, everyone laughed enthusiastically. On the surface, it would seem that a large gathering of MLM professionals would just naturally be biased against corporations. Yet there was profound truth set forth in that response. In this group were several former corporate executives who had turned to network marketing, and they knew firsthand that men and women in traditional corporate management positions are not being productive. Memos and meetings do not profits make. The Yarnell's 39th Law We have friends who, after struggling to earn their MBA degrees, joined marketing divisions of Fortune 500 companies, and then worked hard for as long as a decade before being promoted into management. Once promoted, they began attending meetings and writing memos. We certainly realize that there are corporate managers who assume tremendous responsibilities and work long hours, but many don't. That's why it's possible to lay off thousands and yet increase profits. Theoretically, if we were to go into a company and terminate 20% of the management, the bottom line would be negatively impacted. But in most cases, the profits are enhanced. That's why downsizing has become the darling of Wall Street. Investors love to see the companies in which they have invested begin to lay off their employees because it generally results in an increase in stock values. Never before have so many high-powered executives been downsized out of their professions. In the last decade, many of them have been attracted to the financial independence and flexible lifestyle offered by the MLM industry. First-year distributors will undoubtedly find themselves engaged in a battle brought on by this change in global economics. We call it the executive explosion because of the monumental convergence of such a huge new pool of displaced corporate executives into network marketing. Generally, these are men and women who made a great living in corporate America, graduated from the finest MBA programs, weathered the first two decades of management cuts, but ultimately found themselves fired from the very position for which they slaved for years. Not only are they competent, well-trained, and polished professionals, but they are also quite effective at playing the corporate politics so prevalent in traditional business. We recognize that corporate executives, business owners, and men and women in specialized fields come to our industry with one invaluable asset, respect. Most people have a high regard for the education, experience, and expertise of management executives, and because of their credentials, distributors will be inclined to listen to what they have to say. But as the executive explosion continues to gain momentum, traditional businessmen and women will also create problems as they attempt to carry many of their former practices into the network distribution industry, practices that simply won't work in our business. In this chapter, we will point out the advantages to our industry as former executives continue to join, but also recommend solutions to the challenges they bring to the industry which inevitably will have an impact on every distributor's effectiveness. And these challenges will extend not only to the entire downline, but often to the upline as well. Advantages Gained by Corporate Executives Joining MLM Beginning in the late 70s and continuing right into the greedy 80s, thousands of corporate managers turned to the network marketing industry for entrepreneurial jobs. But never has there been a greater influx than in the last decade. No longer regarded as the little lady's part-time home party plans, 
network marketing has gained increasing momentum and grown into a respected industry in the 90s. Meanwhile, prices for franchises have soared amidst overkill legal fees and inevitable government interference. Both the low downside and high upside potentials of MLM are being discovered by an increasing number of white-collar professionals, college graduates, college professors, successful corporate managers, chief executive officers, CEOs, physicians, dentists, health care specialists, CPAs, attorneys. The credibility of the industry is building under the influence of this sophisticated new generation of professional networkers. As more professionals join network marketing, the trade press is reporting on our industry and individual companies in a much more positive light. Network marketing is being discussed in such leading publications as the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Success, Working at Home, Chicago Tribune, and by the Associated Press, as well as in a wide range of regional newspapers and special interest publications. This credibility is also extending into the university sector. Over the past decade, there has been an ongoing debate as to whether or not Harvard University teaches network marketing. We think it's an issue of semantic gymnastics. Maybe Harvard doesn't teach network marketing, but in April of 1997, Harvard Ph.D. Dr. Charles King gave a lecture about network marketing at Harvard to the Harvard Law School Office of Student Life Counseling, the Harvard Association of Law and Business, and the Harvard Business School Marketing Club. Challenges Posed by Corporate Executives Joining MLM Faced with no substantial savings or transitional income, many downsized corporate executives turn to MLM in a desperate attempt to recapture their former lifestyles. These are good men and women who, frankly, don't know the first thing about our profession and don't understand that they don't. When they see a group of former blue-collar workers and non-corporate types, whom they feel have somehow blundered into $30,000 to $50,000 a month without a degree or any sophisticated knowledge of business, it captures their attention. They figure that if people with less education and experience can achieve that kind of wealth, then there is no limit to what they can do, especially with their credentials. These men and women are faced with two challenges as they enter into the field of network distribution. First, an unmistakable desperation stemming from their loss of prestige and sudden withdrawal of benefits, company cars, and income. Second, a misguided conviction that they can transfer their corporate management style into network marketing. Because so many corporate managers have recently entered our profession, it's only natural that corporate practices would begin to infiltrate network marketing. But they've brought into our industry the very practices that led to low productivity and unjustifiably high incomes in their former traditional corporate management positions. On the other side of the coin, there are two obvious challenges that displaced corporate executives pose to our industry. First, because they are typically very high achievers with great egos and impressive credentials, former executives can often intimidate new distributors who sponsor them. Second, these former executives are inclined to employ many of the tools they used in traditional business, systems which are simply not effective in network marketing. Once intimidated, sponsors no longer command the respect necessary to coach such executives. So the executives take immediate control and begin implementing their own high-tech systems and attempt to manage everyone. Don't make the mistake of assuming that someone you sponsor who has special credentials and comes from a strong corporate background knows more about our business than you do. As Aaron Lynch points out in his wonderful book, Thought Contagion, Less credentialed people can recognize the restrictive effects of credential systems well enough that they don't even try to impart beliefs to someone with impressive credentials. If you have been in the business longer and have been trained properly, it is critical that you exert your power and train your corporate executives as you would instruct anyone else you sponsor. If you take control from the very start, you will earn respect. Robert Holloway of Dallas, Texas, represents the corporate dissident as well as anyone we know, but one who did it right by duplicating exactly what his mentors taught. His career progressed from his early days as a scientific programmer and engineer 
through the real estate development stage with his business partner, Roger Staubach, to his current network marketing empire. Almost no corporate executives join network marketing because they're at the height of their success. Most join this business hoping against hope to put the pieces of their lives back together. Robert was no different. He describes his own situation. The beginning of my career in MLM was not one of the highlights in my life. My real estate business had slacked off considerably with very little potential for positive change in the near future. I had watched an exciting and profitable real estate career go sour. The markets had completely evaporated. One year prior to my introduction to network marketing, a former real estate developer had come to me with this great idea about water filters and said if I would just get in his business, I could make him a lot of money. I asked, what about me? And his reply was, oh, well, you can make a lot of money too. That did not sit well with me, although I was impressed with the proposed earnings potential. About one year later, I was invited to a business presentation on a new growth opportunity. It sounded like a real estate deal. Little did I know until I arrived that I was being invited to an MLM presentation. I had a lot of overhead, and the last thing I was interested in was network marketing, especially selling skin care products and shampoo. My background was in engineering and development, and my pride said this was the last thing on earth I wanted to do. I had just lost millions of dollars in real estate downturns, and now I was going to call friends to tell them of my new MLM career and ask them to join me? At first glance, I could not see why any of my friends would want to do that. Now, after building a multi-million dollar business and developing a quality lifestyle, I can't think of one reason why everyone wouldn't want to join me. But I had learned from working at IBM, and especially after struggling in the commercial real estate market, that if success was going to happen, it was up to me. The Mindset of a Corporate Executive Robert Holloway shares some of his insights into understanding the mindset of corporate executives and business people. I began to contact my closest friends and found that most wanted to improve the quality of their lives and make money. But I wasn't prepared for the second part. Most were unwilling to do anything about it. I found that most people had come to accept their fate in life. Layoffs, downsizing, corporate mergers. They had very little hope and no dreams to follow. They were not happy where they were, but the fear of doing something that might further erode their situation was greater than the anticipation of the positive results from taking charge of their lives. Many corporate people today can't envision themselves being successful in a new venture because they see themselves, in many cases, totally unhappy in their chosen fields. How could MLM improve their status? The answer, of course, is that their personal future is yet to be written. Why not direct the future in a way that brings continued expansive growth as opposed to stagnation and confused regrouping? The challenge is to understand that our job is not to find people and change them. Our task is to find the ones who have already come to the conclusion that they need to change and then get them the information they need to satisfy their research. Those who develop positive outlooks and apply our concepts with commitment and consistency are able to build dynamic, successful businesses. This is one of the most rewarding opportunities available today. In the next few years, thousands of lives will be dynamically changed for the better through network marketing. This business is all about timing, catching people at the right time in their lives when they are open to new areas of opportunity. If you can give corporate executives good information relative to their specific concerns, then you have reasonably good odds that they will move to the next level of investigation. Once they use the products, see the potential of expanding multi-billion dollar markets, and sense the rewards of the marketing plan, they will be ready to be involved in the training system and the business building process. I have discovered two essential facts about dealing with the corporate person or business professional. One, they want information that documents that the business is legitimate. Two, they respond better if you are yourself committed and building a business, because they understand that you can show them how to duplicate your success. If you are a new distributor, you may need to use your upline to close corporate people. Mark Yarnell had to go a full six levels upline until he found someone with experience, Richard Call. 
None of the distributors between Richard and Mark were seasoned leaders. The process is still the same. Prospects need proof and direction. The faster you provide these resources, the faster they can do their research, make a decision, and move to the next stage. Either they are ready to get started, the time is not right, or this business is not for them. The first two are positive decisions, but many inexperienced networkers will not recognize the second stage as positive. And if you will use the follow-up card filing system, which we recommended in an earlier chapter, with those for whom the time isn't right, you will eventually sponsor some of those people, too. If the business is not for them, ask for referrals. As Robert explains, most people completely misunderstand when a corporate person says no. It's not that they don't want to make more money and have free time. It's just not the right time for them to pursue it. Six months can change everything. Most people don't understand this and see it as a personal rejection. A person new to MLM often doesn't realize that being turned down just means that the timing simply wasn't right. Don't take it any more personally than that. I'm convinced more than ever before that the timing today could not be better to launch a career track in network marketing, one that can change a person's life for the better. Robert's forthcoming book, entitled From IBM to MLM, explains in detail the steps necessary to take control of your life, develop a vision, become energized, and put your plan into action. He and his wife Karen live in Dallas, Texas, and work the business together. With all of their success, they now have the time to pursue their real passion, sailing and exploring faraway islands, stopping in each little port along the way. Last summer, we had the joy of being introduced to the sport with them while yachting our way around the Sir Francis Drake Channel in the Caribbean. Greece is next. Corporate executives can become among the greatest distributors in your organization, or they can blow everything and ruin your entire downline. We've seen both happen. The way to prevent the latter from happening is to exert your strength from the very beginning and let them know how very different MLM is from traditional business. We have been very fortunate to learn a great deal from Terry and Tom Hill. They are the only truly high-powered sales professionals we've ever sponsored. Terry was the number one Xerox sales rep, and her husband, Tom, was a Merrill Lynch stockbroker. They have been invaluable teachers to us with respect to the executive explosion. They taught us about the executive mindset and the necessity for structure. More importantly, Terry shared with us many of the sales strategies employed in corporate business and, specifically, why they don't work in our field. We want to begin by examining a few of those strategies to see why they are ineffective. Networking Strategies the antithesis to traditional business. Networking strategies are often the very antithesis to traditional business and conventional marketing systems. Corporate executives often erroneously believe that strategies that brought them success in traditional business will work in MLM. Sadly, most don't. But because of their egos and previous leadership habits, they instinctively seek to reinvent the wheel. As these respected executives bring in new systems and create new sales tools based on traditional business, they unwittingly lead other distributors astray. Because of their credibility, they can sway their upline as well as their downline. Of course, many new distributors just naturally assume that these formerly successful executives know what they are doing and adopt their traditional strategies as a means of succeeding in MLM. We're going to say it once more. Take control, be decisive, and lead yourself. Give up meetings and memos. It isn't easy for a corporate person to give up meetings and memos. They are ingrained in executives. So first and foremost, teach your new frontline distributors coming from the business world that MLM is a work program and that success comes to no one during the time that they are attending meetings and typing memos. One of our frontline leaders sponsored a former manager of a large division of Phillips Petroleum. Within the first week, we started getting lengthy memos, either faxed or emailed to our home, detailing the amount of work he was preparing to do. 
One day we called him and thanked him for the memos, but explained that it wasn't a valuable use of his time. He was crestfallen by our comment. To him, memos were life. He quit after two weeks. He didn't understand that memos mean nothing in our business. Action is the only thing that counts. New distributors, especially from corporate America, must be taught from day one that product usage, prospecting, and recruiting are what lead to success. Memos and meetings are time wasters. Replace high-tech systems with personal storytelling. The most common mistake by corporate professionals is the overuse of high-tech systems in building a network marketing business. While current high-tech communications seem very advanced, they can also be a rather cold, sterile way to relate to others and simply don't prove effective in our business. Many corporate professionals who join the simple home-based business of network marketing will try to structure it to look like the business world from which they came. They want to create slideshows, use projector overheads, and give computer-generated PowerPoint presentations. They will try to assemble formalized presenters and printed charts, rewrite manuals, and generally mimic the activities that were relevant in their former position. Some will even set up offices. See Chapter 7. For a former corporate executive, the most difficult aspect of our business to grasp is that MLM is designed to be something that all folks can do. If you try to turn it into an exclusive country club or corporation, you defeat the very essence of network marketing, which is about having significant numbers of people in your organization, prospecting, recruiting, along with using and sharing the products and services. Make certain that every step you take can be duplicated by the very least skilled in your organization. If done properly, ours is a business that sends prospects home thinking to themselves, I can do that. I have a living room and a VCR and friends who need more money and time with their families. I really believe I can do this business. This is a business of storytelling and sharing personal ups and downs. Traditional business instructs you to emphasize your strengths and past successes. To break down the walls of resistance, network marketing teaches you to share your vulnerabilities, the circumstances leading to your hitting bottom, as well as your successes. It is generally the downtimes that open the door to network marketing for many people. But more importantly, it is hearing a very personal story that makes other people relate to you as a real person. It is very difficult for typical corporate executives to share their weaknesses with others. They have rarely, if ever, been encouraged to do so. But it is the emotional, passionate, personal side of this business that creates its deeply human appeal. Systems such as slideshows, email recruiting, high-tech computer websites, hotel meetings, mass mailings, and a host of other traditional impersonal marketing strategies do not work nearly as effectively in the simplified, easily duplicated field of good old-fashioned work-at-home network marketing. Lead by example instead of by delegating. Once in network marketing, traditional business executives must leave behind their habit of delegating responsibilities and begin to lead by example. Executives are forced into the trenches in MLM, for many, letting go of their former image is unbearable. Most managers, administrators, and supervisors have spent their lives telling others what to do and overseeing their activities. That same behavior in network marketing can lead to the rapid death of your entire organization. Do you know why? Because ours is a business of duplication. Whatever you do, your people will duplicate. If each one is managing his group and no one is prospecting, recruiting, and presenting the business opportunity, then that organization will stagnate. The healthy organization begins with action at the top. The leader should be in the trenches, prospecting, setting appointments, frontline recruiting, and using and sharing products and services with a small customer base. The leader should not be supervising anyone, but rather showing them what to do by example. If you duplicate that throughout your organization, then you will certainly have a living, breathing, thriving business. Never qualify your prospects. 
Because of the executive explosion, new distributors will recruit people who were formerly quite successful marketing reps with major corporations. One of the very first rules of thumb followed by professional salespeople and brought with them into MLM is the importance of qualifying a prospect. For example, a typical marketing rep selling $3 million laser printers usually tries to make certain that a company both needs and can afford that specific printer, that is, qualifies the prospect before making an approach. But when executives and marketing reps use that principle in MLM, it doesn't work. Here's why. Those who succeed in building huge organizations in our industry are frequently people who have no business background, no former sales experience, no college education, and for all practical purposes appear to be those who would not succeed. Our best description of the type of person you are trying to recruit is one whose back is against the wall financially, who is driven by a cause, who is coachable and willing to follow your system without changing it, who comes across enthusiastically, and finally, who enjoys working with people and seeing them become successful. But when executive types come on board, they unfortunately tend to qualify their prospects and exclude many who would ultimately make them a fortune, all because they don't appear qualified. The best advice we can give to corporate executives who have just entered our industry is this. Wake up each morning and resign as general manager of the universe. Don't play God. Anyone can do this business. Whether they will put forth the effort is entirely up to them, not you. It is also important to keep in mind that a far-sighted networker will make room for all kinds of people in his or her organization. Wholesale buyers, retailing distributors, part-time organization builders, as well as people who pull out all the stops and take this opportunity to the moon. You don't want anyone to feel out of place in your network. As long as your people are taking steps to achieve the goals they have set for themselves, they should feel a sense of belonging in your group. A typical and successful organization will consist of a balance of all types of people with all kinds of objectives. It will be made up largely of wholesale buyers who are faithfully ordering and reordering products and or services month after month. A good organization will also have a share of retailing distributors intent on selling products or services as their primary means of earning an income. Next, there will be part-time networkers who are working toward building an organization of distributors for the purpose of replacing their income. And finally, the smallest group will be those who are full-time maniacs going crazy with this business, setting records in MLM history. Always look for the serious business builders with whom you can partner, but make a place for everyone in your organization. Truly, the more diverse, the merrier. There is no value in qualifying your prospects. Organization Building versus Retailing Products with this influx of executives into the network distribution industry, there is a far greater understanding of the value of building an organization of people who do three things. Use the products or services, share them with others, and find others who will do the same. It takes a lot of people, each doing a little bit, to make it all work. But for many today, as in the early days of the industry, there is confusion over whether to place your emphasis on product sales or on building an organization? The answer lies in deciding what you want out of your business. Home parties, clinics, and retail sales create immediate short-term cash in hand. Building an organization of distributors who use and share the products and duplicate this process produces long-term residual income. With some exceptions, such as medical doctors, most professionals entering the networking scene today prefer the passive residual income from organization building over the immediate gratification of product movement. Even those who come into our industry unaware of anything but the ability to sell products, like scholar-athletes Steve and Jeanette Back, will often inadvertently discover the longer-range value of building an organization. But they aren't alone. It was November of 1979 when Jan Rui first learned about multi-level marketing. I had a four-year-old daughter, Sarah, and a two-year-old son, Clayton, and was invited to a product demonstration. 
I wanted to join the day I attended, but the company rep told me that she wasn't going to be associated with the company anymore and that I would have to call her upline. I called that next person and left her message after message. She finally called me back and told me to stop annoying her. She then informed me that our company was very new and they had stopped letting people become sales reps until the following March. On the first day of that month, I called the local sales rep in Dallas, Texas, who told me I could stop by the church where she was working to pick up a form. She didn't want to mess with getting it to me. I joined while I was pregnant with my soon to be daughter, Ashley. We had no money. I was sick of being broke and sick of always asking my husband for a little money. I never really thought in terms of wanting financial independence. I just wanted to have some extra money. I was 30 years young and not willing to live like a pauper for the rest of my life. My husband had no desire to be financially successful, and I felt captive with three children, not being able to earn any money without leaving them. I called my mother and asked her for the startup kit deposit, but she discouraged me, certain that these kinds of home parties were not for me. She said I should stay home, be a mother, and let my husband's income provide for us. I was disgusted with her attitude and called her mother, my grandmother, who said, Honey, I will be happy to invest in you. I'm going to stake a claim in your future. That day I knew I had found the perfect vehicle. It seemed perfect, a real business that allowed me to be with my children and sell a product out of my home. I just didn't know yet that it was network marketing. The day I joined, my local upline associate quit. And my next upline associate was located in California. I was the only sales rep for my company in the entire south of the United States. No training, no meetings, no support. Oh well, I was determined to be the best salesperson I could be. At my first home party, 20 people were there and I sold $75 in product. Wow! Someone actually bought from me. I was thrilled. I booked a few parties and my business took off. As I showed the products in private home parties, people lined the hallways to buy from me, and some even asked how they could sell and become involved. Well, I had no idea, so I told them that they couldn't join me, that I was the only one who could represent this product to the public in Dallas. Can you believe that? I didn't understand about recruiting, but I booked more parties than I could handle. About six months into the business, I decided to take a look at the small company manual in the bottom of a box in my garage. It said that my company was an MLM business and that I was to recruit others to sell the product. Well, blow me away! I had no idea and had never kept the names of the many who had asked to join me. I'm still looking for those people today. This moment of discovery created such a wonderful visual for us. Just thinking about her rummaging around in her garage and being blown away when she read her manual made us laugh until we cried. The next six weeks, she continues, I focused on recruiting and found 13 people who also wanted to sell. At that point, my California upline associate called me. In fact, everyone called me. In 1980, those 13 distributors made me the top recruiter in the history of the company. One of the recruits told me that she only wanted to do parties and that she would not recruit. I had booked the coming fall with home parties almost every other night, which represented more than half my business. I remember that I had baby Ashley in my arms when that newest frontline called to inform me that she was quitting the same day she joined because she had called all of her friends to book parties and they had already committed to come to mine. I made one of the hardest and, as it turned out, most significant decisions of my career. I told her she could have the home parties that I had booked. Through those parties, she became the top seller that year in our company. And though I was pretty bitter at first, it gave me more time to be with my three babies, all under four years old. In spite of herself, she ended up recruiting six people, whom I trained and supported. As my organization grew, I set up a tiny office in a corner of the playroom so that I could work and supervise my children at the same time. I got on the phone prospecting and following up for hours each day. Even with the care of the children, I made at least 20 calls a day. 
I was driven by the money. Everyone else in my entire company was mission-oriented, save-the-world type people. Not me. I wanted to make money. I figured out that if I made my mission helping enough others make money, then I too would eventually make money. And it worked. I also took my three babies to the zoo and to parks every other day. They had a great time while I prospected. I was determined and driven. I would do whatever it took to get some extra money. I was propelled to success because I wanted the money to put Sarah and Clayton into a private school in Dallas. The day I gave away my parties to my new recruit and focused on finding others who wanted to recruit or do parties, that's when my business took off. I focused on getting a lot of people doing a little bit. By the end of that year, I had 24 people in my group and had earned about $5,000. By the following January, almost everyone quit. I just started all over again. I can't believe I stuck it out. My children and my business were my entire world. They both flourished, but my marriage did not. I'm sure none of you can relate to that. I survived divorce, mega-debt, single parenting, the death of my grandmother, the death of my upline, miscarriages, along with the ups and downs of being the head of a growing MLM organization. I thank God every day that someone recruited me into MLM. My parents have moved from Texas and now live close by. My mother became one of my sales reps. My children have turned out to be wonderful young adults. Two have now completed college. I got to stay home, and now my family and many others in my downline are reaping the rewards. Today, 18 years later, Jan is happily married, living with her second husband in a mansion on the top of a mountain in Aspen, Colorado. Through network marketing, she has become a millionaire with over 7,000 people across the nation selling almost $10 million a year. She is the author of three best-selling books in MLM, the Working at Home September 1997 issue of Success Magazine featured her rags-to-riches story. Her motto in those early years was, Lead me, follow me, or get out of my way. It is still her motto today. Many distributors come into this business because they fall in love with the line of products and want to make money telling everyone about them. Organization builders, particularly those who understand business, love to have retailing distributors as part of their group. But we owe it to everyone to make sure they know that the option is always there for them to elevate their goals through duplication. The day Jan gave away her home parties to one of her frontline associates is the day her business began to take off. Why? Because Jan accidentally blundered into one of the cornerstone principles of multi-level marketing. We elevate ourselves by lifting up others. And it is interesting to us that it all began when an unselfish grandmother refused to accept mediocrity for her granddaughter and chose to invest in her future. God bless that darling lady. Building a Network Organization Full-Time Having left the world of traditional business behind, the first challenge to a networker who was formerly a big business man, as Mark is fond of saying, is the loss of his pride. A lowered self-image is the greatest challenge to former corporate people. Even though they were overworked and or underpaid and or laid off or about to be, still, in their former life, they were somebody, with a title and a fancy office to prove it. Now they are at the bottom of the rung and have to prove themselves through productivity, and that can be scary. The first step in sponsoring and training corporate executives or business people is to be sensitive to the fact that they are probably at the most vulnerable place in their lives. They may still have the old bravado in their talk, but don't be fooled by it. They need you right now. Show them your strength and lead them through the steps to be successful pointing out the blatant differences between the world of network marketing and their former world of traditional business. Encourage them with your every word. As product manager for a major Wall Street investment firm, Jay Prim supervised 56 branches throughout California. Although he was given a great deal of independence as the only manager in his firm on the West Coast, 
he can still recall the adjustments he had to make as he transitioned into full-time network marketing. In January of 1989, when Jay signed up with his company, the stigma of MLM was much greater than it is today. As Jay explains, It was really tough, and I took a lot of heat from my friends who thought I was crazy. My father continually dropped hints in those early days about my getting back to a real job. Jay left the glamour of the Transamerica building in San Francisco for a bedroom office in his home. On a bad day, even he questioned what he was doing. Even if he was miserable in corporate America, he could hide behind the prestige of a job that at least looked wonderful. Then, as Jay describes, there was the urgency. I had allowed myself exactly one year to replace a six-figure income. I was sick of being battered by corporate America. The more I did, the more they expected. Now I was running my own show, and I was excited. I was accountable only to myself and no one else. I had to deal with all of the usual preconceived notions about this industry. I thought of myself as being a resource for people. Basically, I just looked for prospects who saw this business the same way I did, as a major global opportunity. I was driven to succeed. I thought nothing back then of putting in 10 to 12 hours a day, 6 and sometimes 7 days a week. We lived and breathed this business. I worked closely with my upline associate, Mark Barrett, and we were recruiting machines. I was in one room on the phone setting appointments, and he was in the other doing his part of the presentation to my people. The biggest problem most corporate people experience in making the transition into network marketing is the total lack of structure. I was accustomed to being fairly self-reliant, but many new distributors miss not having someone tell them what to do. Mark handled this by throwing corporate types, like me, to the wolves. Since my previous position was as a trainer, he played off my strength. By the first week, I was doing presentations before I even felt like I knew what I was doing. It was baptism by fire, and it was the best way for me. The busier I was, the happier I was, while caught up in the frenzy of those early, desperate days. One year later, Jay had replaced his income. Six months after that, he had multiplied it five times again. Today, Jay lives just outside of Boulder, Colorado with his wife, Betty, and their two children, Jason and Ashley. He and Betty travel extensively to Asia and other parts of the world to support their downline. He works from home in an environment where his children have never known it any other way. They've grown up with the misguided notion that most dads work from home and spend most of their time with their family. What a concept! We're certain that when Jason or Ashley find out that other dads go to offices and write memos all day, they will have a similar response to Jan Rui. Well, blow me away. Building a Network Organization Part-Time Building a part-time network marketing organization while holding down a full-time job presents many challenges. Part-timers must often deal with their bosses' negative reactions their spouse's skepticism, all the while maintaining an equilibrium throughout the process. Any one of these is enough all by itself to destroy the possibility of success. Sandy Ellsberg describes her doubts about her husband's initial pursuits in MLM. One evening, my husband, Bill, told me to get all dolled up because we were going to a hotel. I decked myself out in my highest heels with ankle straps, adorned my hair with oleanders, and off we went. When we arrived, he waltzed me into a room full of three hundred people, right up to a front seat on the aisle where a guy in plaid polyester pants and a dark brown polyester jacket with white top stitching told me I could make $28,000 a month working part-time. Instinctively, I folded my arms, crossed my legs, and closed my mind. After growing up in a city project and working long hours for ten years as an elementary school teacher, I couldn't even imagine the seemingly obscene numbers this guy was throwing at me. I leaned over to Bill and said, Look, Buster, the Brooklyn Bridge is sold. We just opened our own clinic, and now you want me to waste my energy on this? But Bill said, Honey, I want to do this. If you're not going to support me, 
at least don't resist. And he added, just be positive for six months. So for six months I barely saw my husband. My father used to call every few days and ask how we were doing, and Bill was never around. When the first check came, and it was a little over one hundred dollars, my father declared, follow him, he's got a girlfriend. But I kept my promise, and the next month wasn't much better, just over three hundred dollars. The month after that, the check was up to five hundred dollars, but he was still spending all of that and more getting the business off the ground, and he was still gone every night and weekend. I accused him of ruining our marriage. He reminded me about the six-month deal. The next check was eleven hundred dollars, then twenty-two hundred dollars. At the end of six months, it was up to thirty-eight hundred dollars, and he was still doing it part-time, putting in full days at the clinic. In all the years I taught school, I'd never taken home more than one thousand dollars a month. At this point, I started to get ideas. Honey, I said, I could write a little training program for you so you wouldn't have to keep repeating the same thing over and over, and people could make a fast start. And let's make a nice little handbook, just like I do for my first graders. That way, everything will be simple and easily duplicated. And you know what? In ninety days, our check doubled. When we made seven thousand dollars in one month, suddenly I could see how twenty-eight thousand dollars a month could be possible. That's when I got it. That is what it took for me to become a believer. I had to experience the process firsthand. I had to hold my skepticism at bay long enough to allow success to happen. I will always be grateful that Bill held me to my promise to reserve judgment for those six months. And as promised, MLM showed me the money. In many cases, people with full-time occupations can start slowly by making smaller sacrifices. This is what Tony Newmeyer chose to do, and he has definitely reaped the benefits. Real estate provided a very good living. However, I had time poverty and was always at the beck and call of others. I was working twelve to fourteen hours a day, six or seven days a week, and my time was not my own. My job was running me. In order to make time for my network marketing business, I had to make some real choices. I decided to get up an hour earlier each day to get some of my real estate paperwork out of the way. I also chose to put some of the activities I loved, particularly baseball and golf, on hold for a while. Getting up an hour earlier five days a week was a simple decision. I knew I would gain over twenty hours a month or a full work week every two months. I knew the leveraging and compounding of time would pay huge dividends in a relatively short period. The key was to use that time effectively. Within a few months, my organization had developed across three time zones. Since I was already awake at five o'clock a.m. my time, I was able to phone people on the East Coast where it was eight o'clock a.m. This proved very effective in spurring growth. Choosing to put my social activities on the back burner for a couple of years proved the most difficult of my choices. Sports were my outlet to maintain my sanity. Fortunately, my wife was extremely supportive. We had a toddler of twenty-one months and a two-month-old infant when I started with my network marketing company. Kate kept the house running and our personal family matters in order, so that I could devote my time to getting ahead. She was and is amazing. I truly felt that by working hard for a few years, we would be set for life, and now that has proven to be absolutely true. Just one hour a day. And a few sacrifices have changed our lives forever. By using this steady, methodical approach, Tony Newmeyer has achieved the honor of being the top Canadian distributor in a large network marketing company. Building a network organization as a single woman. There are hundreds of thousands of single women like Jan Rui in network marketing. Their struggles to build an organization while accepting their other responsibilities as wives, mothers, and female executives have been valiant. Today, there are just as many flocking in from corporate America. As president of a company while still in her twenties, Carmen Anderson was responsible for the sale of a chain of restaurants and the accompanying real estate. 
She put in 16-hour days and 7-day weeks with employees, FICA, overhead, food costs, paperwork, and meetings, meetings, meetings. As Carmen describes her experience, After completing my projects with this company, I had the good fortune to have an entrepreneurial friend who knew me during my tenure as an executive. She told me there was a better way. Find the right vehicle, work hard for a few years, and create leverage so you will be paid whether you work or not. I'd always worked very hard at any job I'd had anyway. So I went to a meeting. Wow! My first impression was these people are happy, and they are earning incredible money. I was definitely open to the opportunity and decided to try the company's products. In two days, the products had relieved some serious concerns and discomfort I had been experiencing. I looked and felt better. Immediately, all my friends who had the same concerns were introduced to the products. I was sharing, not selling them, and felt really good about being able to help my friends. Next thing I knew, I was off to Hong Kong sharing the products and business with people there when our company expanded internationally, then Australia, then New Zealand. In Hong Kong, I met the man who later became my husband, and he finally got me back to America. We now have two babies, a boy and a girl just more than a year apart. And guess what? I have a global business based in my home here in Alabama while I take time to enjoy my children throughout the day, and spend quality time with my husband. I'm happy and fulfilled. Life just doesn't get any better. Carmen and her husband, Joel, live with their children in Sheffield, Alabama, and keep a condo in New York. They also have a marvelous yacht in Boca Raton, where we welcomed in a memorable New Year with them. Sandy Ellsberg's experience, once she was left on her own to build an organization, epitomizes that of so many women in our industry today. After some moderate success with our first MLM company, our fortunes took a decided turn for the worse. Bill developed a chronic debilitating illness that prevented him from working the business. Then we discovered that the MLM company in which we'd invested so much of our energy and hopes and dreams had let us down. About seven years after starting our first MLM business, we'd reached a serious crisis. I was 41 years old and nine months into a high-risk pregnancy with a four-year-old child in tow. My ankles had swollen to the size of thighs. Bill was still very sick, and we had no health insurance. We were worse than broke. Broke would have been easy. With our credit ruined and over $250,000 in debt, we didn't even have enough cash to buy a large package of diapers at the supermarket. Talk about scared! If I'd seen a light at the end of the tunnel, I'd have thought it was an oncoming train. But, like Mary Pickford said, failure is not in the falling down, but in the staying down. Just in time, a friend introduced me to another networking opportunity, and I set out in my beat-up Volkswagen van, without heat, air conditioning, or a radio, driving up and down the 405 interstate doing home parties. When it was cold, I put on a pair of woolen booties to keep my feet warm while I drove. When it was blistering hot, I kept my makeup in a little ice chest in back of the van to keep it from melting. I didn't have the money to run ads. I couldn't buy a fax machine. Heck, I couldn't even put more than five dollars worth of gas in the car at once. But I knew from previous experience that this industry delivered. I was willing to go into the gold mine with my pick and shovel and dig as long and hard as I must in order to succeed. And guess what? After that first month, I'd earned a bonus check of $7,000, which arrived the day after the baby. What's more, I also pocketed about $4,000 in cash from retail sales. Having lived this story allows me to understand, at a gut level, what it feels like to be a discouraged welfare mother, or a laid-off middle-aged corporate manager, or a retiree eating oatmeal three times a day at the end of the monthly Social Security check. I know what desperation feels like, but I also know that with the eye of the tiger and the willingness to do whatever is necessary, we each have the ability to create our own success. It's not luck. It's not magic. It's what's inside us. 
We have known Sandy for several years now, and this is the message she delivers so sensitively to women audiences. There is not a single woman with reasonable skills and serious drive who cannot pull herself out of her plight and achieve greatness. Sandy and Bill Ellsberg live in Dove Canyon, California. Sandy has gone on to become a major advocate for the industry and a much sought after speaker among network marketing companies nationwide. As an upline associate to Sandy Ellsberg, Jerry Rubin had these kind words to say about her. Sandy is a veteran of network marketing, but every day she approaches the business like it's the first day of the rest of her life. She is emotionally and intellectually involved in the business and comes to it from the depths of her soul. She's a product of her mentors and her life's experience, and she works harder than anyone I know. She's one of the best teachers in the business because she understands how she got where she is. If you understand how you got where you are, then you will be able to teach others how to get there too. You may remember Jerry Rubin for his Chicago 7 anti capitalism protests in the 60s. By the 90s, he had dramatically changed his thinking. He and Mark were working on a book together called The Capitalist Manifesto when Jerry met with an untimely death. Most of the world remembers Jerry Rubin as a radical who dared to smoke pot during an interview on national television. But we remember him sitting in our living room in Reno just a few months before his death, moved by the quietness of our environment, so contrasting to his own. The real Jerry was a sensitive man who had become a caring capitalist. He was prepared to do whatever it took to help others rise to their full potential through the very system of capitalism that many of us ridiculed in the 60s. We miss him dearly. Single women are pouring into the network distribution industry because it is the last bastion of free enterprise. Whether you are coming from the corporate world, because like Terry Hill, Jay Prim, or Carmen Anderson, you found a better alternative to corporate America— or you're a homemaker like Jan Rui, who is sick and tired of being broke and dependent on her husband, or your back is against the wall like Bill and Sandy Ellsberg, you can build a networking business. All of these success stories have two things in common. One, they went the extra mile in the early stages to make it work. Two, when it stopped working, as life deals us all setbacks from time to time, they put their makeup on ice and start it over. Supplanting Executive Attitudes With more and more defectors leaving traditional businesses and corporate positions to follow the call of network marketing, we should all do our best to keep the typical executive attitudes from carrying over into the network distribution industry. Seek Personal Development Over Monetary Gain It seems fair to say that most executives are preoccupied about how much money they are making, where they stand in the income structure among their peers, and, in most cases, worried that wherever they are isn't high enough. They are often distressed about the many side effects of their profession. Sixty-hour weeks, stress-induced coronaries, layoffs, mergers, and hostile takeovers. Network marketing has had a transforming effect on many businessmen and women in this regard. Gary Leeling of Temecula, California, had been a dentist for 27 years. He describes his own transformation. Dentistry was initially good to me, but about 1987, things started to change. HMOs, OSHA, liability problems. I was virtually practicing law to keep from getting sued all started to make life difficult. I stuck my head in the sand. After all, dentistry would never fail me. Dentists are supposed to make big bucks. It continually became harder to make ends meet, and I finally began to look for something else to do. But every business out there looked like built-in failure to me. Network marketing wasn't even in my vocabulary. I would never stoop to that. In August of 1995, while I was attending a dental seminar, One of the other dentists there mentioned a network marketing company to me. That definitely wasn't for me, but when I heard they had dental products, I thought maybe I could sell them. 
Ultimately, I came to love the products and agreed to go to one of the company's leadership seminars. By December of that year, I found myself not only selling the products, but also enrolling several of my colleagues in the company. With great difficulty, I managed to sign up 13 others, but by February, all of them had quit. I was batting zero. Out of desperation, and fortunately for me, I attended another company-sponsored leadership seminar, and one of the leaders in my upline volunteered to coach me. It was from that moment forward, at the ripe old age of 52, that I started to discover an entirely new life philosophy. Network marketing was first and foremost about personal growth and development. Through a number of seminars and the cultural influence of my fellow networkers, today I am a different person. My business is exploding. My relationship with my wife Dixie and my family is at an all-time high, and my outlook on life has changed from pessimistic to optimistic. Although I still practice dentistry part-time, I no longer feel like a dentist with all the worries and preoccupations that go with being one. I now feel like a network marketer with an opportunity that can benefit everyone. I have a great outlook on life and am doing what I enjoy with an enthusiasm that I never knew was possible. Exalt Others Instead of Ourselves Without passing judgment on all executives, there is a tendency among them to demonstrate an egotistical disposition. We are great. Those who work for us are inferior to us. All of this success is due to our brilliance. But in network marketing, it is just the opposite demeanor that makes this business work. Pat Hintz and Steve Schultz, partners in their network marketing business, discovered the real secret to MLM's success. This is a story you may find yourself repeating over and over as you build your business. It accurately describes the real nature of our industry as well as any we've read. We hope you enjoy sharing it as much as we have. As Pat and Steve tell it, Our story is definitely not one of overnight success. The truth is we have simply outlasted most of the others in this industry. For three and a half years, we worked this business with so little results it's almost embarrassing to discuss. We went through every possible negative human emotion. We asked ourselves repeatedly, why won't this work? What are we doing wrong? Why is everyone growing faster and bigger than we are? Will this ever really work for us? We went to every rally, every function possible. But even those seemed to be more depressing than exciting, because all we ever heard were the tremendous stories of success about other people. Just once we would have loved someone to stand up and say, I drove three hours last night and got stood up. Now that would have made us feel great. If there's one thing we have learned about this business, it's how easy it is to put yourself down. Just compare your success to the success of others. There will always be others who are experiencing more success than you are at any given time. But we kept going because we thought we might find the secret to the business. We lasted long enough to do just that. We traveled eight and a half hours to a rally, intent on finding the secret. We knew that the top money earner in the company was going to be there. We got there early so we could find out from him the key to making this business work. We found him and started asking him a barrage of burning questions. How do you do this? How did you make it work? What is the secret? His answer was a bit surprising. He said, I really didn't do it. I've got good downline people. They have actually done it. Why don't you ask them? So we did. But they said, We really didn't do it. We have good downline people. They've actually done it. Why don't you ask them? So we did. But they said, We really didn't do it. We have good downline people. So we came away from that meeting understanding that no one actually does this business. It's just something you give away to other people. So we went home and tried to find some other people we could give it to. And it worked. The law of large numbers will rescue the persistent. We kept trying long enough to eventually find others to whom we could give it. People who knew what they were doing. They were actually making their organizations grow. We got excited and started exalting them, 
telling everyone about their success. Then they found others to give it to, who started having more success than they were. Incredible! We started pointing to their success, and others got inspired by what they were seeing. Over the last three and a half years, all we've managed to do is stumble across a few others to whom we've given this opportunity, and they were able to do the same. Today, we have thousands of people across the country trying to give this business away as a gift to others. Oh, we get the chance to stand up in front of many people and take credit for it, but really, we didn't do it. Steve is a former teacher, and Pat is a former sales rep for a paper company. Today, after seven years, they are among the very top income earners in their company. We are talking millions and millions of dollars a year. During the early years, before it all started working for them, though they never seriously considered quitting, they developed a philosophy about starting over that they explain in this way. Even today, we continue the practice of starting over again as if we had no one in our downline. It helps us stay focused on what really makes this business work. Persistence. The one thing we've learned is that failure cannot handle persistence. First-year distributors, in particular, must avoid the temptation to follow the high-powered systems brought to our industry by former corporate executives during the executive explosion. Be sure to show empathy toward those leaving the corporate world in droves to join our industry. Despite outer appearances, many of them are scared and vulnerable. By leaving behind the security of titles and structure, they are faced for the first time with the awesome responsibility of self-reliance. Give them straight answers to their questions. Teach them the system of duplication like you teach everyone else. And if the timing is right, they will do it. Or rather, they will not do it, but give it away to others who will do it. And in turn, will give it away to others. In the words of Ignatius Joseph Furpo of Truckee, California, What we have done for ourselves dies with us. What we have done for others remains and is immortal. Summary The executive explosion refers to the huge influx of corporate executives joining our industry, bringing with them the same management styles that led to low productivity and unjustifiably high incomes in their former careers. These executives face two challenges as they enter the field of network distribution. One, an unmistakable desperation stemming from their loss of prestige and sudden withdrawal of benefits, company cars, and income. Two, a misguided conviction that they can transfer their management strategies from traditional business into network marketing, an industry without managers. Most upline distributors have a high regard for the education, experience, and expertise of corporate executives and are naturally inclined to listen to what they have to say. In light of the respect they carry, former corporate executives pose two obvious challenges to our industry. One, as high achievers with great egos, they often intimidate the very distributors who sponsor them. Two, even though many of the tools they used in traditional business are simply not applicable to our industry, they try, nevertheless, to introduce management styles and high-tech approaches into our business, which can sidetrack both their upline and downline associates. Even if you have a blue-collar work background, don't make the mistake of assuming that some corporate big hitter knows more about our business than you. When teaching former corporate executives, take control in your training and teach them how different our MLM business is from traditional business. Given the fact that many former corporate execs are discouraged after their departure from traditional business, your task is merely to sift out those who seriously desire change and are at the right time in their lives to join MLM. The quicker you can provide corporate people or business professionals with information about the upside potential of our business, the faster they can do their research and make one of three decisions. One, they are ready to get started, a positive step. Two, the time is not right. 
A positive step. Use the card file system to follow up. 3. The business is not for them. Ask for referrals. New distributors, especially from corporate America, must be taught from day one that product usage, prospecting, and recruiting are what lead to success. Memos and meetings are time wasters, as are the creation of slideshows, presenters, overheads, and charts. While traditional business encourages people to emphasize their strengths and past successes, network marketing teaches people to also share their vulnerabilities, the circumstances that lead them to MLM, in order to break down the walls of resistance. It is generally this down experience that opens the door to network marketing. Telling your personal story is what makes other people relate to you. They want to hear why you've chosen this industry as a solution to your former problems. Unlike passing the buck in traditional business, executives who want to build a large organization in network marketing must leave behind their habits of delegating responsibilities and begin leading by example. Do not qualify your prospects, but rather make room for the widest possible cross-section of people. Home parties, clinics, and retail sales create immediate short-term income. However, building an organization of people who use and share the products, and then teaching others how to duplicate this process, produces long-term residual income. A lowered self-image is the greatest emotional challenge for those who leave the corporate world and enter full-time into network marketing. Many part-time networkers worry about their boss's negative reaction and their spouse's skepticism while maintaining a positive outlook throughout the early stages of the process. There are hundreds of thousands of single women in network marketing struggling to build organizations while meeting all their other demands as wives, mothers, and female executives. But there is not one with average skills and strong drive who cannot achieve greatness. Network marketing can have a profound effect on many business people after they discover that, first and foremost, our profession is about personal growth and development. Unlike the corporate work environment, there are no threats to an executive's position in network marketing if he exalts his downline. A profound truth about our industry is this. Possessive clinging will never lead to success. Only by giving the business to others will you ultimately receive huge rewards in the remarkable world of network marketing.